midway between Yavat and Nandagram. It's actually closer to Nandagram, but it's in between geographically. So I'm eating and many other things at Ter Kadamba. Here's uh, an image of a Kadamba tree. And there are other names of a Kadamba tree. You see the fruit or flower is this ball-like cluster. And uh, it's in season, of course, that produces these interesting um, flowers or fruits. And the Ter Kadamba is a whole grove, a miniature forest, very tightly packed up with Kadamba trees, especially during the time of Krishna. And the Kadamba trees pr pr provided many services for Krishna. One of them was, at the end of the day, when Krishna was herding cows, they would come back naturally to the Goshal by the side of Nanda's residence, Nanda Bhavan or Nanda Gaon. And Krishna would climb to the top of one of the Kadamba trees, playing upon his flute that not only made very special transcendental sounding music that attracted the hearts of every living entity in Vrindavan, but it had the capacity, by playing upon his flute, to call all the cows. The way that Krishna did this, transcendentally, was the cows, 900,000 cows were in different groups, and there's names for each of the groups based upon their color, and based upon their shapes of the head, of the cows, one group of cows is called Mridanga Muki. Everyone knows what Mridanga is. And Muki means face, so their, their heads were shaped like Mridangas. And he would call the names of the groups of cows and they would wait to hear the sound of Krishna's flute every day, calling the name of their group and their ears would perk up and they would call out loudly, and come running with their tails in the air to go to the Goshal. And if there was a single, he, kept, he had a string of jeweled counterbeats, and he would count every day, like we count our japa. Krishna counted the cows using his jeweled counterbeats. And if there was any cow that was missing, he would call that cow by name, because each of the cows had names, and Krishna knew the names of all the 900,000 cows, and his flute knew how to call out the name of that particular cow, and they would wait to hear their name called, and who knows how much ecstasy they were feeling to have their name called by Krishna's flute. And they would call out loudly, Moo! <laughs> Reciprocation of loving dealings with the cows and Krishna's flute. And sometimes Krishna, in the evening hour, would climb one Kadamba tree, and he, using his flute, would call the gopis, and they knew that sound it was for them, and they came, and they would have their rendezvous at Ter Kadamba, a meeting place of Radha and Krishna. Now, we're, we can't go physically, at least presently we can't go physically. Hopefully we'll be able to go in the future together. But when you go to Ter Kadamba, you will find on the altar... Inside the grove of trees, and you'll see in a moment what the inside the grove of trees looks like, there's these very beautiful Krishna Balaram deities. Just like that. Very beautiful. And <clears throat> above the altar, above the altar, 
So as you're looking at the altar, above the altar, there's a placard. And the placard says, Adadanas Tanam Dantair, Idam Yache Punak Punakshi Mad Rupa Padamboja Radhi Rajoham Syam Bave Bave. This is taken, it's by Raghunath Das Goswami. It's found in Dana Kali Chintamani. Dana Kali Chintamani, we spoke about when we did our Govardhan Parikrama. It's a book by Raghunath Das that's describing the pastimes of Krishna's taxing the gopis by the, um, by the side of Govardhan Hill. Maybe you remember that. Here's the translation. Taking a blade of grass, chin means straw, taking a blade of grass between my teeth, dantire, my teeth, I repeatedly, puna, puna, I repeatedly beg that birth after birth I may obtain the dust of Srila Rupa Goswami's lotus feet. Now, mention is made here of Rupa Goswami because at Terkadamba, it was one of the favorite places of Rupa Goswami to take shelter of Krishna and the love of Radha for Krishna, the meeting place of Radha and Krishna. And there he would write, it is said that a major portion of his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu or Our Nectar Devotion was written at this place, Ter Kadamba, and thus it's his place. And thus this little placard above the altar that's composed by Raghunath Das Goswami about Rupa Goswami. I, I'm making mention of this because it's very significant, very significant. We've heard by visiting Radhakund and Shamakund, the places of Raghunath Das Goswami and Rupa Goswami. Raghunath Das by age was younger but by realization, he, <laughs> a most outstanding member of our disciplic succession, Raghunath Das Goswami is the Prayojana Guru. He teaches the process of achieving spiritual perfection, not the process, what the stage of spiritual perfection is. Raghunath Das is speaking like this, or writing like this, about Rupa Goswami. He simply wants birth after birth, dust from the feet of Rupa Goswami. And to confirm, in a different book, Raghunath Das Goswami writes almost the same thing. It's another book called Mukta Charitram. And the first part is the same. And when you hear Dina Bandha recite this verse, he recites the second part. The Mukti Charitam, Srimad Rupa Padambo Jaduli Sham Janma Janmani. Janma Janmani, birth after birth. Duli Sham, Duli Sham is, may I have some dust from the feet of Rupa Goswami. Here's another photograph of the same Krishna Balaram deities because when you visit, when we visit, when we get to visit, not just virtually, but the um, Pujari was a wonderful fellow. Um, he brings the deities out, places them on a throne like you see in the background of behind the deities. They're not on the altar. They're out for everyone to see because they're very accessible and warm and friendly. And here's what the Kadamba forest looks like. Really fascinating. Now these aren't Kadamba trees, it's some other kind of trees, but it's um, what Ter Kadamba looks like. Here's the Sadhu. 
He's got some high-technology microphones strapped to his head. And he uh, regularly tells a little story about Radha and Krishna, performed right here at Ter Kadamba. He places a cloth over his head, so he's like one of the gopis, and he interacts with the audience, and the audience, there's photographs of the audience laughing and laughing, and he's got everybody rolling on the, in the dust of Vrindavan. And you can see he's a happy man. Celebrated at this Ter Kadamba place is this painting, which we'll see other versions of. It's Rupa Goswami writing, and the painting is indicating a pastime with Radharani and Rupa Goswami, where he was writing and writing and writing, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And on this particular day, it was his brother Sanatan Goswami's birthday. So he wanted to do some service for Sanatan Goswami on his birthday. Now what does he have? He's a sadhu and he has nothing. But he was thinking, it would be nice if I could offer him some sweet rice or some nice preparation like that. So he was writing and writing, and lo and behold, down the path came a young gopi who was carrying milk, sugar, rice, ghee, camphor, and saffron. And there's another version that says there was a wedding, and she brought to Rupa Goswami some sweet rice, knowing that today was his brother's birthday. And she offered the sweet rice or the ingredients, the version she brought the ingredients, Rupa Goswami was busy writing, so she cooked the sweet rice. And then, after some time, Rupa Goswami went some short distance away. We're also going to visit that short distance away place, the Bhajan Kutir of Sanatan Goswami, one of his places of Bhajan, was by the side of Pavan Sarovar, maybe a few hundred yards or half a kilometer or something like that from Ter Kadamba. And uh, he gave the sweet rice to his brother on his birthday. You know, happy birthday, right? <laughs> and <coughs> Sanatana Goswami was very pleased and asked, you know, where did you get the ingredients? How did, were you able to pr provide this? And he started tasting the sweet rice, and it was out of this world. It was marvelous. It was transcendentally tantalizing. His hair was standing on end, tasting the sweet rice. And he started asking again, how did you get these ingredients? And Rupa Goswami described what you see in the painting. And then Sanatan Goswami transcendentally realized what that meant. And he said, oh no, you've caused me to take service from Srimati Radharani? Oh brother, Sri Rupa, how could you have done this? But the sweet rice is so nice. <laughs> and he continued eating the sweet rice. We'll visit Sanatan Goswami's Bhajan Kutir shortly. Very nearby. It is said that Rupa Goswami's transcendental emotions were so profound that as he was writing something that was very sad, transcendentally sad, like separation of Radha and Krishna, the leaves of the Kadamba tree under which he was sitting would wither and fall to the ground as if dead. And then when he would write something that was very joyful, the leaves would, boop, 
sprout instantly, little leaves and become full leaves. So much moved by the power of Rupa Goswami's transcendental moods, just even in his writing. So we should also be very attentive when we read Rupa Goswami's writings. Just like that nice Radhastika, Radhastikam uh, prayer that we heard. I've heard it multiple times and it's so nice. You can hear it again and again and again. The writing of Rupa Goswami is just wonderful. And the Kadamba tree responded to his moods. So some distance away, not far, is the Bhajan Kutir of Sanatan Goswami. And there's Dina Bandhu. Look at that. He is standing at the gate. Now, the last time I visited, it didn't have a gate like that. But this has got like a big metal, you can't get in when the door's locked, kind of a gate. And it's by the side of Pavan Sarovar, which we'll also visit. And now let's take a look at Dina Bandhu paying obeisances in front of the, pla the sitting place of Sanatan Goswami. And we'll have a look inside. But first, as you walk through that gate that you see behind Dina Bandhu, this is what you'll find. There's a bit of a courtyard. And uh, in that courtyard, there's this entrance to the, uh, the actual Bhajan Kutir. And there we see the Bhajan Kutir directly before. That's the sitting place where Sanatan Goswami would perform his bhajan, his chanting, and his absorption in Krishna consciousness. Now look at the photograph on the left side. You see two domes. And one of those domes, or nearby one of those domes behind a bit, is the samadhi, no, bhajan kutir, excuse me, of Akinshina Das Babaji. Now, many of you may not know who is this, Akinshina Das Babaji. It's another name. <laughs> but he's a, a god brother of Srila Prabhupada. He's a uh, disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta. And he was um, a kind of celebrity of sorts during his life because of his constant, constant, constant absorption in the holy name. He has some writings that are just very simple. <laughs> it's just the holy name. Uh, I didn't have the fortune of his association, but I've heard Bibi Govinda Maharaj describe what his association was like. And when he starts speaking about Akinchina Das Babaji, he just lights up and becomes like a bright light bulb. Just thinking of him, meditating upon him, glorifying him. Very elevated Vaishnav. Very dear to Prabhupada. He came to see Prabhupada in his final days. And he had many exchanges with Srila Prabhupada after his return to India. So these two places, these Bhajan Kutir structures are by the side of Pavan Sarovar. And uh, we'll take a little look around Pavan Sarovar. You can see it's a very large body of water. Um, to the right, there's some spire of some temple. And from a different direction, here's just, this is just a nice photograph of Pavan Sarovar. And on the left side, left corner, at the sea level or at the water level, there's a yellow building. Inside that yellow building, um, there's a deity. Again, you see on the far right is that yellow structure. And here's the deity of Radha and Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there's a close-up of the deity of Krishna. 
So the history, there's a wonderful history behind Pavan Sarovar. Let's go back and see. Pavan Sarovar is a place where it's at the base of Nanda Maharaja's palace or his home up on Nandagram, up on the hill. And <clears throat> every morning he and Krishna would come together and take their morning bath at Pavan Sarovar. So just the fact that Nanda Maharaj and Krishna came there regularly is enough. But there's a wonderful pastime connected. One day, Krishna saw Mother Jasoda making some special cooking, not the usual prasad that she would prepare for Nanda Maharaj. You know, the dal and chapatis and things that people in this climate would take every day, vegetable. It was fried things. And uh, Krishna asked his mother, very determinedly and very politely, what is it that you're making? Is it for me? <laughs> and she said, I'm busy. Go play with your friends. <laughs> said, she asked again, Mata, what are you making? Is it for me? And she said, it's for your father. Oh, why is it different than the, the meal that you normally make for your father? Can you tell me? She said, your, your father is, is going on a pilgrimage. Where is he going? Where is he going? <coughs> He's going to Prayag. Where is Prayag? Where is Prayag? <laughs> this is how Dina Bandhu tells. He asks the same question five times, like little children will do sometimes. And uh, so she says, go ask your father. I'm busy. So he went to Nanda Maharaj. He said, yes, I'm going to Prayag. It's, uh, what's special about Prayag, father? It's, the, it's a very sacred place. It's a confluence of three sacred rivers. And I'm going there to take bath because it's said, I heard uh, a, a scripture class saying it's such a special place. It's the king of all holy places. I want to go there for purification. And when are you going? I'm going today. And Krishna said, not a good idea to go today. You should go tomorrow because Akshaya Jatiya, tomorrow, the very auspicious day. If you go there tomorrow, you'll have an auspicious journey to go to a very wonderful place. So his father smiled and said, okay, I'll go tomorrow. So that morning of Akshaya Tritiya, Nanda Maharaj went to take his bath as he would do every morning. But something a little different happened that morning. On the, on the opposite shore, you see it's a very large water body. Uh, he saw a, a celestial looking being, very regal, um, raising his arms and calling loudly and taking his bath and coming out of the sarovar and rolling around in the ground and then taking his bath again and rolling around on the ground again and is wondering, who is this person? What's he doing? I've never seen him before. So very respectfully, Nanda Maharaj is a Vaishnav. He went and asked this celestial-looking being, I've never seen you here before. Who are you and why, what has brought you here so early in the morning? He said, I, my name is <coughs> Prayag Raj. I'm the king of the place, Prayag, where many pilgrims go. And many pilgrims come here to Prayag to deposit their sins. And at the end of the year, every year on Akshaya Chuchi, I come here to this place to take my bath, to become purified and roll in the dust of Vrindavan. Nandamara said, oh. And then he saw on the other bank, 
about uh, many celestial ladies that look like goddesses from the heavenly realms, dressed in fine ornaments and fine garments, and they were preparing to take their bath and rolling in the dust. And he asked, who are you? And what has brought you here? I'm the Jamuna, I'm Ganga, I'm Godavari, I'm this one, I'm that one, Mandakini, I'm this one, that one. And many pilgrims come to our place and deposit their sins, so we come here once a year here in Akshaya Chatiya to take our bath, to become purified. Oh. <laughs> so when Nanda Maharaj went back up the hill, because his Nanda Bhavan is on the hill, you'll see. Um, little Gopal asked him, today is Akshaya Chati, are you going? And Nanda said, I think I'll just stay. And from that day, it was called previously Nanda Kund. Now it's Pavan Sarovar. Pavan Sarovar. Because even the places where people were, would become purified will become purified by Pavan Sarovar. Here's a, a photograph of Nanda Bhavan, or Nanda's temple or palace that he built um, at, the, at the top of uh, Nanda Maharaja's hill. It is said <coughs> that Lord Shiva had requested uh, some service of Krishna. Krishna said, you can become the hill. So the hill is the hill of Lord Shiva. There are five places where it rises up in the air. So five heads of Lord Shiva. Uh, here's a, another, looks like a painting. Maybe it's a photograph, but it looks like a painting from a different angle. And it doesn't show, as you see in this one, there's a big tower. <laughs> and it doesn't show that on this side, so I think that's a painting. In any case, um, the little history, when Krishna was born, he was born in the prison house of Kamsa. And and that very evening of his birth, he was transferred to Gokul. He remained in Gokul for three years, four months, at which time the whole of the Vrajbasis and the uh, family of Nanda and his brothers and everybody went to Vrindavan. And from Vrindavan, he went to, um, he stayed for some time and went to three other places before he ended up in Nandagram. He ended up in Nandagram when he was six years, eight months, and he stayed until he was 11 years, eight months, at which time he was taken to Mathura. That's the little chronology. And Chatikar and Dig are names of places where Krishna went also. Here's a photograph of the temple that's at the top of the hill. Yeah. Um, the third place was Kamyavan. Chatikar, Dig, then Kamyavan. And I know Kamyavan is one of the places that um, Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj likes very much. Maybe he'll speak about Kamyavan. Let's see. And then to Nandagram. So there's Nandagram. Uh, on top of the hill. And here's what's on the altar. On the altar, you'll see uh, Nanda Maharaj with the mustache there, the tall figure. And to his right is his uh, queen or his wife, Yashoda. 
At the far left, looking at the altar, is Rohini, and obviously in between is Krishna and Balaram. Krishna and Balaram are both holding a flute. And I can't remember for sure, but the altar on the far right, our far right, I think it's Krishna's dear friends. But I wasn't able to find out for sure to confirm before this class. So here's a close-up of the Krishna Balaram at the center of this altar. And then a little bit closer image of that central altar. Nanda and Yashoda and Krishna and Balaram. Now there's different days where there are different dresses. This is a very colorful dress. That, uh, resolution is not good, but you can see the whole altar very nicely. And just to the side of that main altar, you have to go, go out of that little temple room over to the side, there's a shivalinga. And you might be surprised, why is there a shivalinga at the place of Krishna? And the answer goes like this. One day, when Krishna was residing at Nanda Bhavan, remember he's not there till he's six years, eight months, up until 11 years, eight months, uh, Lord Shiva knew that Krishna had appeared on earth and he wanted to have his darshan. And so he went up the hill and presented himself before Mother Yashoda requesting an opportunity to have audience. But she thought he was a tantric yogi. He looked very strange with ashes smeared on him and serpents around his neck and a garland of skulls. And she did let him see Krishna, so he disappointedly went left. He went back down the hill where he had been doing some meditation, meditating on Krishna. And as he left, Krishna started to cry. And they brought doctors and nothing could stop Krishna from crying. They asked, he wouldn't say. And then Yashoda understood. I've offended this mendicant, and this is the reason that I'm having this reaction. So she sent some people to find him. And it's not so far away, Asheshavan, we're going to visit Asheshavan. It's near the base of um, Nanda Maharaja's hill. If you make a little triangle, it's you know, kind of in between, distance-wise, in between Terkadamba and Nandagram, but it's not in a direct straight line. It's a little bit at an angle and across a field. So they found him and they brought him before Krishna. And immediately Krishna smiled, stopped crying. So Mother Yashoda apologized. I didn't understand the dearness that you have to Krishna, so I made an offense. Please forgive me. Is there some service I can do for you? And Lord Shiva said, I would just like some remnants of the prasad of your son. And so she gave. And to this day, up on the hill, where the deity, after offering to the deities of Nanda and Yashoda and Krishna and Balaram, some remnants are placed by this Shila, Shivalinga, to offer him the remnants daily of Krishna's prasad. Now the place where Lord Shiva was doing his meditation is pictured here. And that their tall dome is, it's the place is called Ashesha Van, a forest for Lord um, Ashesha. Here's a photograph of a Parikrama group inside the temple, and there's the uh, Shivalinga in the center with Parvati 
and we'll see the other side is Nandi and um, Ganesh and the their other son Kartikeya. It's not a often visited place, but it's uh, the celebrated place where Lord Shiva was doing his meditation on Krishna. Here, <clears throat> at Esheshavan, Anantashesh. One of the other structures here is pictured, uh, and inside this other picture, oops, this other place, is uh, a deity of Lord Shiva in his mood of being a gopi. Now somehow the images got shuffled in the wrong direction, so I'm going to put them in the right direction. Hold on. We, when we visited um, Radhakund, we heard some details about Lord Shiva wanting to be um, to experience Krishna's Rasalila performance. Maybe you remember that. And um, yeah, here we go. It was uh, Kundeshwara Mahadev, if you remember. There's a. Oops. Yeah. There's a Shila as you enter, just before entering into Radha Kundaria, that uh, is a. During the daytime is a regular Shila, a, a uh, Shivalinga. And in the nighttime, the deity of Lord Shiva is dressed as a gopi. Because at night, Lord Shiva participates in Krishna's Rasa dance by guarding the Rasa dance. There you see Lord Shiva at the bottom. On the right side, here is Lord Shiva. And there are some musicians playing while um, the Rasta dance is going on. And Lord Shiva's service that Krishna gave him is to guard the Rasta dance. He guards the Dham and he guards the Rasta dance. So this Asheshavan has this deity where Lord Shiva is in the evening is in this mood of participating or observing and protecting Krishna in his Rasa dance pastime, shown in this painting. And this is another artist illustration of Lord Shiva becoming a gopi. And at Vangsivat, this is the by the side of the altar where Krishna's Rasa dance at Vangsivat was performed. There's Lord Shiva. You see the serpents around his neck. You know, somebody asked, how come if he's a gopi, he's got serpents around his neck? It's just his paraphernalia. Like Narda, Narda but becomes Naradi. Narada's got his tambur or vina. No problem. Everybody knows. At the Base in the uh, southern direction is um, how Balao. Now there used to be more. There used to be f five or seven of these, and they were stolen over time. But this is how Balao. And I want to explain something because it's going to come up shortly also with another pastime. Many of you know that Jiva Goswami wrote six Sandarbhas. And the first of those six Sandarbhas is Tattva Sandarbha. And in Tattva Sandarbha, the first part, the first half, is Jiva Goswami's explanation of why the best evidence to know about Krishna is Srimad Bhagavatam. So very detailed step by step. Uh, compelling you know, explanation. Why we 
followers of Lord Chaitanya accept Srimad Bhagavatam as the best evidence to know anything about anything, and certainly about Krishna. So in that Tattva Sandarbha section, text 9, he explains the three, three primary ways of knowing things. Everybody in ISKCON knows those three primary ways of knowing things. What are those three? Direct sense perception, inference and logic, and shabda, or hearing, from authoritative source. And Jiva Goswami, being the scholar that he is, he expands those three into ten. And those other seven are just subsets of the three. But they have names. And one of them, you see on the screen here, is Atihya. Atihya. Which in English translation means tradition. We had this discussion earlier when we were doing this circumambulation of Radhakund. And here we go again. Atihya means there is something that can be accepted as true based upon sound, based upon hearing, and the authority rather than aparusheya shabda praman, rather than knowledge heard from a perfected source, which is what scripture is, there is another which is Atihya, it's tradition. Do you remember, I'm sure you remember, when Krishna was speaking to his father about the Indra Puja that it was being organized, he asked his father, what is this? Is it something that's enjoined in scripture or is it something that's family tradition? That's this Atihya. Now family tradition doesn't mean it's a zero but it's not a tent. It's a way of knowing things. And you may not understand how the family tradition became a family tradition, and sometimes traditions are really goofy. Sometimes. Prabhupada tells a story about it. Here's a story that makes it really goofy. Uh, one pujari found that there was um, a, a mouse that was climbing on the altar. And so, to take care of the mouse climbing on the altar, he got a cat. And so, the son watched the priest. Whenever there was a, a, a ritual, he got a cat and kept the cat by the altar. So then, the next generation, you can't worship without having a cat by the altar without understanding the purpose behind. So sometimes tradition is silly. But sometimes it's generally the, 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 the explanation given, the commentary by Baladeva on this Atihya is um, it's commonly accepted. Not just a story, but a commonly accepted pervasive acceptance. So in Braja, the how Balao story is commonly accepted. There's no scriptural reference, so it's not as strong as a Podushe Shabda Praman, but it's not a zero either. So it's just, this is a nice story, and we, we don't just narrate any silly story, but those that are commonly accepted. Then we're going to come across another one in this morning class. So the, the, the how Balao story goes like this. Krishna was playing with his friends um, on the southern side of the temple, the southern side of Nanda Bhavan. And um, it was lunchtime. So Mother Yasoda said, I'll complete the cooking. You bring your son and Krishna. It's time for lunch. So Rohini went. And they were so immersed in, in playing, they didn't even pay attention to her. It wasn't insulting. They were just little boys being very playful. And so she went back and said, I think you're going to have to go because they won't even pay attention to me. I'll finish the cooking. So Yashoda went with Rohini finishing the cooking. 
to the place where the boys were playing, and she tried different measures, speaking sweetly, speaking strongly, speaking demandingly, stomped her foot, everything, nothing worked. And she then um, tried another method. She grabbed him by the hand, and the boys said, if you leave, we're not going to come back tomorrow. We're not going to play with you. You, you, if you leave, then we're, it, the, the, our game is over. So Krishna shook his hand free from his mother, and they continued playing, and she got really resourceful. She did something that mothers will sometimes do. She told a lie. We came across this yesterday, right? Yes. Yesterday? So the lie she said is, you better come really quick. I see here they come. Here comes the how below. And Krishna said, what's how below? I never heard of how below. And, or it's how. And uh, she said, oh, they're very fierce looking. They have big sharp teeth. They're full of fur. They make loud noise and they love to eat little children. Let's go. <laughs> and Krishna said, I don't believe in how. And she looked and screamed and started running, and so they didn't even look behind. They're coming, come quickly. And so in the future, any time they would n not come for lunch, that's what Mother DeSoto would do. The hour coming, let's go. But then there's another a, a, a sequel to this. One time... Krishna said to Mother Jasoda, how came? It was really scary. She said, go, Paul. I just made up the story of hows. There's no such thing. He said, there is such a thing. And here they come. And Mother Jasoda screamed and started running. <laughs> and when Krishna saw Mother just so to scream, he turned them into stone. And they became how Balao uh, by the side of Yasoda Kund. And uh, when Mother Jasoda said, How come you saw how? He said, Well, my mother never tells a lie. I believe whatever she says is true. And so they came. Very sweet. Finally, we're going to visit um, a nice place. It's not in this vicinity, but it leads into tomorrow's discussion. And I don't read this language, but I believe you can read the language. It's Pilipokar. What does it say? Shriyakund? So Priyakund is another name for Pili Pokar. It's another name for the same place. Priya. It has to do with Radharani. Priyakund. Um, Priyakund or uh, Pili Pokar. Pili has to do with the yellow color that the pond became yellowed by Haldi. And here's a picture of the place. And on the far side uh, is a little altar. But it's, a, it's nicely developed today. And it's a place where Radharani washed her hands. You know, here's, the, here's the scene. And as we heard yesterday at Yavat, when we visited Yavat, there was a prophecy or a benediction given by Durvasa Muni to Radharani that whatever she cooked would be this and that and the other thing. And, and therefore, from an early age, Radharani, sent by her mother, went from Varsana early in the morning to Nandagram. And every day she would cook, she and her gopi friends, 
under the supervision of Rohini, would cook for Krishna. And as it naturally would happen in the course of time, Mother Yashoda developed a loving affection for Radharani. And those of you that are parents or, you know, mothers of daughters, it's natural for the mothers of daughters to think, who would be a suitable husband for my young daughter? So she was thinking like that about Krishna. Who would be a suitable wife for my son, Gopal? And uh, the natural conclusion was Radharani would be the superlative best person. And so there's this long description of how she considered the qualities of Radharani in glowing appreciation of her character, her charm, her beauty, her gentleness, her respect, her, her everything was perfect. So one day, in fun, she brought Radharani to her side, and Radharani was very submissive to anything that Yashoda had to say. She said, stick out your hands, and then she started rubbing, rubbing uh, a, this healthy mixture on the palm of her hand, or the side of her hand, the back of her hand, as we see today. And uh, she smiled. Seeing her smile, Radharani is smiling, and Yashoda asked her, do you know what this means? No. What does it mean? It means you're now engaged to be married. That's our tradition and our village. You're engaged to be married to our son. Now you need to go back and ask your mother and father if that's okay. And smiling, Radharani's in deep perplexity, because nothing's been spoken to her parents and she enjoys her freedom. And M Mother Yoshida said, you know, at some point you can't just go running around. You have to be bound in marriage. That's uh, how a cultured young girl like you behaves. So with her friends, she's in a great dilemma. What should I do? How do I speak to my parents? And she's in a tizzy. Lalita says, no problem. Why are you distressed like this? It's very simple. On your way back to Varsana, you find a nice lake and you wash it off. And nobody will know. We won't tell anybody. And nobody will know. And then you'll have to figure out a way to deal with the affection and the expectation of Mother Yashoda. But that's just now, when nobody's looking, nobody's around, go quietly and wash your hands. And everything will be nice. So here's another um, photograph of the area. Here's, an area. here's a time of the year when there's the algae is... Oh yeah. Here's the water level is really high. And here where the water level is quite low, it's at different times of the year. And here's somewhere in between. But it's the same water body. And uh, here's Radharani washing. So as Radharani is washing, everything comes off, but it is said, now there's two uh, different versions or narrations, she not only deposited the turmeric or the haldi, but her bhava, her love for Krishna became deposited in this. This made it very, very special. Therefore, Priyakund. And her friend said, let's go. Let's go quickly. No one's, no one's around. Let's go. But by the time she got back, to Varsana, news travels fast. Uh, Vrishabhanu and Kirtida heard. They said, we accept. 
And they made a, a whole cartload of ornaments and jewels and expensive items like a dowry to, and sent it to Nandagram as a message saying, we accept. And Yashoda was in big anxiety. They accept, but we don't have wealth like they have. So what are we going to do? I think we have to ask Purnamasi what to do. So they went to Purnamasi and she said, no way. It's an inauspicious time, nothing can happen. Just put it off. And everybody forgot because of her influence, Yoga Maya's influence. But this place, this particular Priyakund or Pili Pokar, is a place where Krishna would regularly go. The second um, narration, this elaborately discussed in Shivara Marsha's writing, very elaborately discussed with verses from Krishna Karnamrita quoted where um, the feelings of separation as Krishna went to this place, because he would regularly t bring his cows there, he saw something different here. And he got closer and closer and he saw it's all golden color. And again, golden color not only from the Haldi, but Radha Bhava. So he was curious. So he dipped in the water. And the old emotion of Radha's love for Krishna surcharged his own being. And he was experiencing emotions like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had in, his, in Radha's love for Krishna. And it's a very beautiful description. Maybe I can read. I'll read parts of it. I'll read parts of it. Because we have time. What's that? Okay. Am I speaking too fast? Okay. Not long after the gopis had left, Sri Krishna appeared at that very spot, intently looking for a stray cow. He did not notice any change in the scenery. Entering the forest, Gopal continued his search until he had passed the lake. Suddenly he thought he noticed something different about the place. He had just passed. Then he discovers the yellow color. Gopal looked to the animals and trees, but they were silent. What happened? Absorbed in their activities, they carried on as usual. Hari rubbed his eyes, but the water remained the same color, golden. He walked down the steps to the water. Perhaps it was the work of some demon. Perhaps the demigods were playing tricks again, like Yashoda trying to discern what she was seeing inside Krishna's mouth. Cautiously he looked into the pond. And, and, obviously he saw his reflection upon its golden surface. There he was, possessed of the same turban, the same peacock feather, the same flute, the same cowherd dress, but there was one difference. His black complexion was now stained golden. I look like a Gora Krishna, he thought. How is that? The birds, deer, Trees and flowers all turned to watch as Krishna reached out to touch his reflection. Suddenly, Hari felt a surge of ecstasy run through his body. It was as if a bolt of lightning had struck him. He drew back and cried, Vishnu, Vishnu, what was that? 
What is this mystical yellow substance? The forest would not respond, only his echo. Yellow substance, yellow substance, yellow substance. Returned his question. Sri Krishna's curiosity intensified. Once again he reached towards the water, and once again the animals and trees craned their necks to watch. Once again Govinda touched the water, and once again his whole body and his whole being quivered with ecstasy as intense feelings of love surged through Krishna. All eight symptoms of sattvika bhava manifestations in his body and his mind was filled with extraordinary loving disposition. It's Lord Chaitanya, right? Hari was amazed at this newfound experience. He was even more astounded by the prema coursing through his heart. He thought, the love I am feeling is something new and remarkable. I am no stranger to prema, but what I am experiencing seems to me as its object. Krishna looked across the lake while briefly pondering the situation. Usually I reciprocate the love of the Vrajabhasis. They are the object of my love. That is natural. But if I examine my heart, I find that as I touch this lake, I feel love for myself. How extraordinary. Govinda's mind raced to understand this newfound wonder. Only the gopis experience and possess this particular bhava. The remarkable, there's a Sanskrit term, kamatmika, or kama-like mood. The gopis have a kama, or lust-like kamatmika mood toward Krishna. It's not but it looks like. I feel, and among the gopis, only Radha manifests bhava to such an exalted de degree. The golden color of this lake is the complexion of her bhava. And the electrifying touch of its waters is the mood of her love. Radhika must have empowered this lake with her prema. What other explanation is there? How very wonderful! How very wonderful! Sri Krishna's appetite for tasting Radha's love was now fully aroused. For what reason was this lake different from others? What would happen if he put his arm into it. No. Better. Yet, what if he fully immersed himself? Looking left and right, he entered the water up to his calves, then his knees, then his waist, and finally up to his conch shell neck. Casting a blissful glance at the trees and animals, he smiled playfully while dipping under the surface of the water. The golden waters happily embraced Hari's transcendental form and for some time he almost completely disappeared. Only Krishna's peacock feather was still visible above the water because the lake was not that deep. As he moved here and there underwater, the movements of the feather plotted the course of his marine activities, meaning underwater. Then, after some time, Govinda stopped and stayed in one place. While Krishna was underwater, the flowers, trees, birds, and bees 
held their breath in suspense. Just when they are on the verge of fainting, he gradually appeared from the yellow waters in quite an unusual state. Still, dressed as a cowherd, Krishna's sapphire luster had faded. His complexion was completely golden. If one were to melt gold 1,000 times, it might resemble the lustrous brilliance emanating from Gorahari's body. That statement is taken from a book about Lord Chaitanya. The change in Sri Krishna was not merely external. It also indicated a change in his inner disposition, his bhava. Coming onto dry land, he looked above as if he were searching for someone as his lips constantly chanted his own names. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Looking left and right, golden-colored Krishna was absorbed in the mood, happiness and ecstasy of Sri Radhika's form, known as Goranga. Within his mind he thought, where is Sri Krishna? This is from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Where is Sri Krishna, whose form is curved in three places? Where is the sweet song of the flute? And where is the dancing, singing, and laughing of the rasa dance? Dipping in the waters dyed by Radha's haldi and bhava caused various ecstatic emotions to evolve within Goranga. In separation from Krishna, his mind filled with anxiety and his patience tottered. In this condition, he recited the following verse, and the verses are, there's many, citing Krishna Karnamrita. Radha, Krishna, Radha's feelings of separation from Krishna, which is Lord Chaitanya's feelings of separation from Krishna. And it goes on. Bathing in the waters stained by Radha's bhava, Sri Krishna became bewildered by her prema and displayed the form of Gorahari. Roaming through the lakeside gardens, he sang his own names, yearning to hear his own flute and cried to see his own form. His mood was identical with Sri Radha's separation from him. Even Braja's creatures cried to see his pitiful condition, but as a mystical potion gradually loses its influence, the effects of the golden water slowly reduced and Gorhari remembered who he was, resumed his Shamarupa, and continued to search out his stray cow. Even now, learned Vaishnavas call this lake Pili Pukur, the yellow pond, or Priyakund. So that's preparing us for tomorrow's visit to Suryakund, where similar pastimes of Radha and Krishna performed. You've seen this image before. Um, here it is again. This is Lord Chaitanya being non different from Srimati Radharani. Let's see what happens here. It's not working. There we go. Lord Chaitanya and Radharani in bhava and in duty being the same. So that's it for this morning. And um, unusually we have some time for discussion.
And I'm really looking forward to spending the day <laughs> preparing for visiting Surya Kund. Hare Krishna. Dear devotees, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute if you are joining the English meeting room. But if you are joining from other language rooms, please express your question to your translator and the translator can unmute themselves in English room and speak out the question. Well, wait a bit. Yeah, um, if you can, at least ask something so that we can test it out. <laughs> we want to test the technology. So, Rabbi Mataji, the mother will ask Prabhu, think the end of Prabhu, then we have anyone. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, and uh, Vamsidari Prabhu. I got a response from uh, some Chinese devotees. They said that today the, the test is very good. Uh, everything, the sound, the picture, are very clear. Okay, well that worked. <laughs> we can hear you very clearly also by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, very clearly. Very clearly. It's very nice. So, Damadar Vilas, can you just uh, unmute yourself and sort of be you mute yourself again? Damadar Vilas, you say something so we can make sure the technology is working. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So it was very nice to hear this pastime of Billy Poker. It's preparing for upcoming Vrindavan Yatra. So am I audible? And yes, very audible. Very audible. Very good. It looks like the system is working. That's um, very good news. Technology hasn't been so cooperative of late. But now it's... Yes, Maharaj, in translation room is also, it's a good, it's a good working Maharaj. Thank you. Am I speaking too fast or it's okay? The speed is okay? Uh, Maharaj, speed is okay, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, your speed, please accept the humble obeisances. Uh, your speed is okay, but the when you are reading the text, um, I wonder if you can read a little bit slow. Reading more slowly? Yeah, yeah. Well, when, when you speak, actually the speak is perfect, but the, when you're reading um, from the scripture, when you quote from, it's just like the, when you're reading um, the story just now, I happen to, you know, um, be switched over as a translator so i find uh, it's a little bit hard for some part it's a little bit hard to follow especially for those very philosophical part i thought i was going really slowly <laughs> is it like that today mataji or you're referring to yesterday no, just uh, just now. I I I just translated just now. So when my mind actually speak, when he speak is okay to speak. But the one reading, if you just can slow a little bit, then that will probably will be helpful. I'll try. Remind Thank me if so I time. forget. Send you know if 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 if, it, if I'm in the midst of reading, and you're finding it difficult, if you could send a chat message, Vangsi Diary will pick up the chat message. You give me the high sign. Slow down. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Marge. This is Thank just you, Marge. this is just preparing everything for you know t 
tomorrow evening's beginning, tomorrow evening our yeah, yeah, time yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah. But maybe maybe the other thing is uh, now is really the end of the day. Maybe the energy level is quite low here, <laughs> so a little hard to catch. But uh, okay. thank you so much, Marx. <laughs> okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. In the Telugu translation room, we have one question uh, from Girivara Dhari Basa Prabhuji. Uh, to understand this, do we need any additional qualification for a sadhaka? Uh, when you are asking the question, uh, you can mute the translation one and unmute this. You can only unmute one of the device. Okay. Because when you were speaking, there was an echo due to leaving both lines open. You have to close one and open the other. Uh, sure, sure, Guru Maharaj. I'll just try, try it again. again. Try it again. Try just Now mute the one and speak so that I can hear you. Y yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, so in the Telugu translation room, uh, Girivara Dhari Prabhuji is asking to understand this do we need any additional qualification for a sadhaka? To understand this, what is the qualification needed for a sadhaka? That's the question. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes. The sadhaka, I will assume that the sadhaka means a, a one who's in the sadhana bhakti stage and one who's in the sadhana bhakti stage is not likely to understand transcendental subject matters other than appreciating how wonderful is Krishna how wonderful is Krishna how wonderful is Krishna and that's the way that a sadhaka should understand. How wonderful is Krishna? He has so many, so it's just appreciation. That's, it's not exactly understanding like we're accustomed to understanding, you know, a math problem or a, you know, computer problem or a kitchen problem or something. It's not, it's not a material understanding. It's a spiritual appreciation understanding. And as that spiritual appreciation grows and grows and grows through the medium of service, then we can start to understand things that you didn't understand today. As you grow spiritually in your appreciation of how wonderful is Krishna, as your bhakti matures, then you'll start to remember things and understand things. Its spiritual maturity will bring the proper understanding, and initially it's, how wonderful is Krishna? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So I think we'll end there. Seems to be wound up. And uh, tomorrow we'll go to Suryakund. Krishna permitting. Virtually. It's a nice place. A place very much loved by Radharani. And maybe we'll uh, sing together the Radhastika song, depending on how many of the leelas, just because, you know, it's, it's the mood Radha's place. That's why I ended with this Pidi Pokar or Priya Kund story. But don't forget the other ones, Isheshavan, Nanda Bhavan, Pavan Sarovar, Ter Kadamba, Sanatan Goswami, Akinshina Das Babaji, all those other nice places. 
Let those thoughts be with you also. Hare Krishna.